As we end our series on statistical inference, I would like to conclude by telling you about some issues in inference. In order to have valid inference, we have to meet certain conditions. First, the scores must be randomly sampled from the population of interest, or if we're looking at scores from conditions in an experiment, they must be from randomized conditions. The key here in both of these situations is randomness, either a random sample or randomization to conditions. Scores must be independently sampled. If we want to obtain an inference on, say, the population mean of education students who take the GRE, we cannot obtain multiple GRE scores from the same student. Those scores would not be independent because they're from the same student. Nor could we allow two students to work together on the GRE. That's pretty unlikely anyway, isn't it? The sampling distribution must be normally distributed. There are two reasons for the sampling distribution being normally distributed. First, the sampling distribution will be normally distributed if the original populations of scores is normally distributed. So, for example, if the scores on the GRE exam are normally distributed, as they are, then the sampling distribution of the mean will be normally distributed, and this condition for valid inference will be met. But what if the original scores are not normally distributed? The central limit theorem tells us that the sampling distribution will be normally distributed if the sample size is large, that is, at least 30 or so. So large here really isn't very large. The key is, we need a normal sampling distribution and we can obtain that even if the original distribution of scores is not normal. A phrase that you will hear frequently when discussing statistical inference is statistical significance, or worse, some people just say significant. A statistically significant result refers to the rejection of a null hypothesis. That's all it means. When we conduct a hypothesis test and the p-value is less than alpha, we say that the result is statistically significant. What's important to know here is that statistical significance does not imply practical significance. Unfortunately, many, many people who practice statistics do not realize this, and they are looking for statistical significance as a way to say that their results are important. In this context, the term significant does not mean important. I have always felt that the term statistical significance is an unfortunate choice. It makes us think of the English word significant, and that is not what this means. A statistically significant result simply means we've rejected a null hypothesis. If I am studying business students who take the GRE, and I want to know if their results are higher than the standard results of 150, and I do a hypothesis test, and I reject the null hypothesis of 150 because, in fact, the average for business students is 150.2, that is a correct rejection because the mean of 150.0 is not the same as the mean of 150.2, but that is not an important difference. So I would say it's statistically significant, but it's not practically significant. Further cautions about inference. Statistical inference is only as good as the measures used to obtain the data. In these video series, we have been using data from variables that have already been measured. We really have not had any input or even understanding of these measures. And if the measures aren't any good, our statistical inference isn't going to be any good. Similarly, statistical inference is only as good as the design used to collect the data. 
If I want to conclude a study making the inference that the treatment is effective, I cannot make that inference if I have a design that's a weak design. I need to make sure that it's a true experimental design before I can make that inference. It doesn't matter what kind of p-value I obtain or what kind of confidence interval I calculate. If a poor design is used, I can ma not make strong inference. We cannot make up for poor measures and poor design with good statistics. Failure to reject the null hypothesis does not prove that the null hypothesis is true. I have stated that several times in this series, but this is a concept that is misused frequently, so I'm saying it again. When you reject the null hypothesis, you simply retain that as a possible or potential value. You haven't proved that the null hypothesis is true. And a final caution. If we conduct multiple hypotheses tests about different parameters, that can lead to a compounding of errors. You might wonder about confidence intervals because we first constructed those by testing multiple hypotheses. But note that those were about a single parameter, the population mean. If we do test about multiple population means or the means for multiple variables, and we do each of those tests with a type 1 error rate of 5%, the error rate for our entire study can go up beyond 5%. So we need to be careful of that and cautious about which hypotheses we choose to test. As you are already aware, when I test hypotheses, it's because I'm going to test a bunch of them for a single parameter because I want to obtain a confidence interval and I hope you do that too. I am also aware that there are still disciplines in which good research is done, but the researchers do not know about confidence intervals, so they use p-values. I understand that. You need to understand that. And just help push the field forward and know how to interpret both hypotheses testing results and confidence intervals. This concludes this important series on statistical inference. As we move into later series, we will be using these concepts and applying them for various types of statistics and various types of parameters. I look forward to assisting you with that.